Hi, everyone. I just want to preface this week's episode by saying that there will be some things discussed about depression and self-harm. And I just want to make sure any listeners are prepared for that. It, there's not a huge detail about it, but I'm talking to someone from To Write Love on Her Arms, which is an organization that is very dear to me. In the interview, I mentioned that I heard about them 10 years ago. It was actually more like 14 years ago when I thought back and looked at the calendar. I found them when I needed help myself and when I was looking for some answers and community and found it with them. So I'm really grateful that they exist. I'm really excited to bring you this talk. I'm not going to go into details about what brought me to them, but I do think it's important that people are aware of this organization. Chad Moses from the organization who I spoke to is truly an incredible person. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. It's a really lighthearted interview, but it also just deals with some really tough subjects. So thank you for listening. Thanks for going with me so far on this podcast journey. If you're brand new to the podcast, I'm Rabia. You'll learn more about me throughout the interview. And if you listen to other episodes, um, also, if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. You can do a review on Apple. The podcast is up almost anywhere. I'm really glad to have you here if it's your first time or you've been with me this entire time. Be well and enjoy the interview. Welcome to More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is defined by more than your job title. I'm Rabia, an IT project manager, comedian, nonprofit volunteer, and sometimes activist. Every week, I'll chat with a guest about pursuing passions outside of work or creating meaningful opportunities inside the workplace. As you listen, I hope you'll be inspired to do the same. Welcome back to More Than Work. My guest is really special. When I started this podcast, I had a list of organizations that I wanted to reach out to, and this was on the top of it. This is Chad Moses. He's director of outreach at To Write Love on Her Arms. We'll learn what that means, what that name is. So welcome, Chad. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Glad, glad we're able to connect. Yeah, me too, and thanks for taking the time. So I just introduced your title, but do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit? Totally. Yeah. So my name is Chad Moses. I use he, him pronouns. I work at To Write Love on Our Arms. Uh, And if you aren't familiar with us, we are a nonprofit organization that exists to present hope and find help for anyone struggling with things like depression, addiction, self-injury, and suicide. Uh, And we do that through a number of programs that are designed to encourage, inspire, inform, and also to invest financially into avenues uh, of treatment and recovery. Great. And it's, I'll just tell you, and I don't, I talk about personal stuff sometimes on this podcast. Sometimes I don't right now. I will. I became aware of you guys when I was looking for help for myself. And this was, you know, many years ago now, like I think, it, well, a little over 10. So I know exactly when it was, but that's when I found you guys. And just even being able to buy the t-shirt, which is what I did. You know, I bought a t-shirt to remind me of things that I wore. I wore it skydiving once. It was always a powerful message. You know, it was um, love is the movement was that t-shirt. So it's like way back, but it's, I think it's a great organization and even the origin story of it is. So can you just talk a little bit about how it came about? Absolutely. So Robbie, you said that you've uh, been hip to us for about 10 years now, which is a, a, a whole chunk of time. So we're, uh, we're about 15 years old ourselves. And when we started 15 years ago, there was no idea that this would turn into a movement or a nonprofit, no idea that t-shirts or podcasts would be a piece of this, but originally it was all about helping our friend and telling her story. So the name to write love on our arms, we're not trying to imply that one gender struggles more than any others with, with mental health challenges, but uh, to write love on our arms was the name of a literal story about our friend uh, named Renee. So the story was about her first five days finding help with cocaine addiction and finding help with self-injury all through the context of community. Um, The way the story goes, she was initially denied entry into a treatment facility uh, because she had used the night before and she had injured 
uh, shortly before going to seek treatment for her addiction. Uh, so there was a group of friends that really rallied around her to make sure that she felt cared for, that she uh, would be coming down safe and good company, that she knew that she had a team around her as she was taking these next steps towards her treatment and recovery journey. So after five days, she was able to enter that treatment program. And uh, a guy named Jamie, who went on to found our organization, he wrote a, uh, a, fi- or a two-page story, rather, uh, about what those five days look like. He called it to write love on our arms uh, because there was a piece of Renee's story that she had written the word fuck up across her arm um, with, with a razor. And to that circle of friends, that, that fuck up, it wasn't a pronouncement of profanity, but it was really uh, a sense of identity that, that Renee was struggling with. So to write love on her arms was more than anything else, a goal that, hey, maybe together as a community, we could help her rewrite this script. So no, Renee, you're not your past. No, Renee, you're not your present situation. Renee, you are more than your future. You are loved in ways that don't depend on you, that we're going to be here through thick and thin. So um, as Renee took uh, steps into treatment, Jamie wrote the story. He put it on MySpace because it was 2006, and that's what we all did. And he made about 200 shirts that uh, had a kind of a, a logoized version of those words that just said to write love on our arm. The hope was to sell those to help offset Renee's medical costs. Well, we had some friends in touring bands at the time, and they wore the shirt as they traveled. And as they traveled, their fans got curious. They would Google the name. They'd read the story on MySpace. And then they would write in saying, you know, this sounds familiar, that this story sounds a lot like my best friend, a lot like my dad, a lot like myself, our hope and help options for us as well. So we really emerged as a response to your response to a story called To Write Love on Our Arms. And here we are 15 years later, really just trying to build a better bridge to connect anyone that's looking for help to local options for help. That's, yeah, and it's it's amazing. And I think, to just the music element is so important and the events element, which right now I know is probably hard with COVID. But I think having seen you guys and I'm, at different shows too, when I was probably a little younger and going to a little more cooler shows than I would now, (laughs) it was always good to see you guys there. And so you're on the event side. So you've been doing a lot of the traveling and setup and stuff. So how's that experience just for you? Yeah. Yeah. So the vast majority of people first uh, interact with us and probably most frequently interact with us uh, online. Uh, Our website is a great source of, of hope and help. That's where a lot of people go to, to kind of um, help unpack their own story a bit, whether that's through our blog or through our podcast, uh, but also to find resources. Um, all that to say, our, our website is kind of our home. That puts us everywhere and nowhere at the same time. But we know that not everyone's just going to stumble across a website. So we've really made a, a huge priority uh, in our operations to be where people naturally come together. So we're mm-hmm. constantly uh, looking for opportunities to speak at high schools, at colleges, at communities of faith. We're constantly trying to be in the middle of activity, whether that's a pride event or whether that's a music festival. Uh, we've done a lot with the yoga community. We've done a lot with uh, more like kind of niche conferences. Um, so we, we want to go where people feel this sense of connection, where people feel seen and heard and valued, and really use that sense of community that, that people experience at these events to just take it uh, one step further. To say, look, if you can feel that sense of connection uh, almost anonymously um, mm-hmm. and, and with a group of strangers in the middle of a festival somewhere, then perhaps you can feel that sense of connection back home with someone consistently face to face. So my job with the organization is really to translate the things that we believe to be most true of our website into face to face encounters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in a non pandemic year, which has been every year since 1918, uh, well, we haven't been around since 1918. All, all I'm saying is this year is weird and different. And I think we're allowed to acknowledge that. But generally, we're traveling nonstop. Uh, last year alone, we were at over 50 different events. And that covered uh, roughly 180 booth days. Um, so whether that was through uh, over the past years through something like the Warp Tour or speaking at colleges or um, being a part of destination festivals like Bonnaroo and Electric Forest. Uh, 
we it's my job to to plan where we can meet as many people as possible cool and how did you come to the organization yeah i learned about us uh, right as i was getting set to graduate college so all of these words depression addiction self injury suicide they really made up uh, the majority of kind of my college experience um, mm-hmm. i often kind of look back with this this deep sense of I don't know if irony is the right word, but but certainly there there was a paradox at play with my college experience. Uh, I served the majority of of my years at my university as an RA, um, mm-hmm. so it was my uh, job to help people navigate what it looks like to go through transitions and and life changes. And and in that, you know, I, I received training for for mental health. I knew what depression looked like. I knew what anxiety looked like. I knew what self-injurious behavior looked like. I knew what suicide, uh, suicidal ideation looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I knew where to, to resource out. I knew where to connect people. But in my life, as I was navigating some serious heartaches, some serious valleys, um, I, I felt like I did not have access to the places that I was consistently putting in front of other people. Uh, I was mm-hmm. really trapped in these cycles of shame that if I ask for help, what will people think of me? Maybe they, they won't look at my behavior as something that is alarming, but maybe they see me as something that's worth being rejected. So it it was really this cycle of, of self medicating through a number of different uh, harmful coping mechanisms and uh, to feel a sense of release and, and yet not being able to, uh, to, consume the resources that I knew existed. Um, this really all came to a head uh, the the summer before my fourth year of college mm-hmm. when I was really teetering on the edge. Um, I was convinced that I was alone in this world. And I, I did something that looking back seems super melodramatic, but super thankful it happened. I, uh, after one really long night after a number of really long, lonely weeks, I took a look at my phone and I just started going through number by number asking who here in this phone would still recognize me, who here in this phone would stand by me. And I identified one name of one person that was my literal lifeline, um, that if this person were to reject me as a friend, then I don't see a place for me left on on this planet. Uh, So my friend uh, answered the phone. And she sat me down and we had uh, a serious talk. Uh, I mean, here's how kind of paradoxical the whole thing is. She sits me down and says, let's talk. I said, about what? <laughs> you know, like that's, that's how oblivious uh, I was to the severity of the situation. That's how skewed my perspective was, thinking that A, I was good enough at hiding my shit from everyone else. Uh, and B, thinking that I could just coyly dance around what could have been my last night uh, on, mm-hmm. on the planet. And my friend just said, look, I've known you for years and I, I, I need to know where you've been. Like, Chad, I haven't seen you smile in so long. Can you let me in? And I really took her questions as a dare. And mm-hmm. I said, all right, here's, here's uh, my self-hatred. Here's my depression. Here's my anxiety. Here's my self-injury. Here's my substance abuse. Here are the suicide notes that I've written and ripped up and written and ripped up and written. And I think this one's going to stick. Can I be too much for you now? And she said, no. Like, what kind of friend would I be to leave you in this space? And then what she said, uh, her next words radically changed how I viewed this situation and how I viewed just humanity. She said, we are going to get through this together. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I believe in you. It wasn't, you can do it. It was, allow me to be a piece of the equation. Welcome me into this. Like, dude, call me when you've had the worst day ever because you don't need to go through that alone. Call me when you've had an awesome day because I can't wait to celebrate with you. Call me just because you don't want to drink coffee or eat lunch by yourself. Just, can you can you promise to, to let me in? So I wasn't fixed overnight, um, but... I did learn that I could share some crap uh, and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't implode. I wouldn't be struck by lightning that I could share my grief and it could fall on some safe ears and on uh, a comfy shoulder and, and onto the compassion of someone else. 
So through the sharing uh, with that friend, I, I was emboldened to share with more people, uh, more friends. I was able to welcome uh, some members of my family into it. I found the courage to, to find a counselor. I found the courage to find another counselor after that. I, and I, so I, I really started learning about what it looks like to share, what it looks like to live in community with other people. Hmm. Um, about this time, uh, as I'm getting my life back together, I learned about the organization through one of my residents who knew nothing about my story, but he said, Hey, like Chad, you, you like music and this is vaguely music like, uh, uh, this seems like a really cool story. You should check it out. So he sends me a link and I read that original story about our friend Renee. And I thought, Oh my God, I can't believe that people are talking about this. I can't believe that I'm not the only one with these questions. And and I can't believe that it's okay that my story and this story uh, that I'm reading aren't perfectly packaged. The story's not over. Like, this is a work in progress. Like, maybe I too can be a work in progress. Uh, so that night, I bought a shirt and I bought a pack of buttons and I bought a bunch of info cards. And I was one of maybe 10 people at my university that knew about this project, but I, I was dedicated to informing more people about this. Um, I sent a cold call email to the organization. I said, I'm about to exit college, which means I'm going to be working for the rest of my life. And I would like to think that for at least one sliver of time, I was doing something that mattered. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so I said, look, here I am, use me until I'm, I'm broke. Um, and, and hopefully I, I leave um, a positive impact on this mission. Uh, so that was over 12 years ago, uh, and I haven't left. But really, to, to kind of put a bow on all of it, uh, if I was going to make a metaphor of, of the past you know, 14 years of my life, it would be that uh, something that a mentor told me, that the only difference between shit and manure is, is purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, that one, you, you hide, one, you shovel away, you try to put as much distance between you and it as possible. The other allows growth to happen through it. So could I allow the shit in my life to positively affect other people? And, and that's really been um, kind of my, my mantra <laughs> ever since that, that maybe even the parts of my life that are painful are still worth sharing in the hopes that something more beautiful can come from it. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, there, I mean, there's a lot there. And I think a lot of your story I relate with in a very specific way um, that almost, you know, I would say even from just how you heard about it, you know, and this, there's always this kind of sort of coincidence that that is kind of more, I think there's a lot of that that happens and someone handing you, you know, information that you actually probably needed anyway. And, um, and then the whole idea of sharing your story, I, I share different parts of my story with different people. Sometimes I'll meet someone and within a minute or two, and you can probably relate to this. I'll know the worst thing about them. Yeah. And I might have told them the worst thing and the worst being not maybe the something bad, but just the most vulnerable thing. Yes. I've struggled to, or yes, I have this illness or I've lost this person in my life, whatever it is, but I've, I've just found, and I don't know if you'll, how you'll feel about this. I want your thoughts. Just the power in sharing your story is so great. And just, it, it, it kind of just keeps working at taking the shame away from it. Yeah. You know, I, I think for a lot of this, um, it, it really turns into a conversation of power dynamics. So when we're talking about um, issues like self-injury, issues like addiction and suicide and anxiety and post-traumatic stress, these things don't just pop up one day, but, but there's things that are precipitating these, these behaviors and these events that are happening in our, in our lives. So if they didn't show up overnight, then I doubt they're going to disappear overnight as well. Um, relatedly, these issues are as old as human beings are, that we have been on this planet for, for untold amounts of centuries and millennia, and we still haven't thought ourselves out of heartache. We still mm -hmm. haven't found the magic words to prevent us from, from pain. That means that 
anything that you're going through is infinitely relatable. Even yeah. if I can't relate to the specific instance that sent you into a tailspin, uh, let's just take, um, you know, uh, diagnosed depression, for example. There are plenty of people on this planet that will never know what depression feels like. My friend that I shared my story with on that first night has never had a depressed day in her life, but she has felt alone at some point. She has felt betrayed at some point. She has felt this loss of power of control over her own emotional well-being for an instant. So from there, we're only talking about levels of severity and frequency, right? Mm -hmm. So so to go back to this conversation of power dynamics, no one is choosing depression over having a good day. Like no one no one used a substance for the first time and thought, I can't wait to be enslaved by addiction moving forward. Like we are dealing with kind of the, you know, the, the consequences of things that have happened to us um, that we didn't really choose how bad the story got. So we start to regain some of that agency, some sense of that power in sharing with one another. We get to be reminded by friends and by mentors and people that have a better perspective than we do on the situation of ways out of it. So I didn't need my friend to fix me. I needed my friend to see me, to hear me, to remind me of things that are true that I forgot over the years. And she could not make me believe in those truths again, but she could equip me and remind me of, of different ways to look at the situation. That is empowerment. And it's very nuanced, but it was it was an invitation to return to kind of my my essential being. What did Chad look like before before pain had the biggest voice in the conversation? It is interesting the idea and I've done a very similar thing. Um maybe even today I might have told someone that, hey, I tend to push things, people away when I'm starting to go down hill. Yeah. Because the minute someone's there and present and you're allowing them to be there and they're willing to, it's kind of taking the power away from whatever that is. Yeah. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And and then in that idea that you can almost sabotage it, I've done the thing where I've reached out to people I know I'll write back. Mm. <laughs> me, right. You know, but you know who, who to reach out to. So I'm glad you <laughs> figured that out. That yeah. Day. Well, Ravi, I think you hit on a really important point there is that, Depre depression, anxiety, self-injury, addiction, suicide, they get the kind of the, the name drops in our mission statement. That's not really what we're fighting here. We're, we're fighting the thing that allows those things to thrive. We would identify that thing as isolation, mm -hmm. that, that impulse to push people away, uh, that look like shame and guilt are different things. Guilt says I did something wrong. Shame says I am something wrong. And shame says, I deserve to be left alone. So if we're doing anything, we're fighting that shame and we fight that shame with community. If, yeah. if isolation is a problem, then community is going to be a piece of the solution. And that doesn't mean kumbaya moments. That doesn't mean summer camp. That doesn't mean fake and flaky first week of college. We're going to be friends forever kind of stuff. We're talking about like getting in deep. We're talking about Stuff like like the Me Too movement that we've witnessed over the years. We're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement that we've witnessed more recently. We're talking about the Stonewall protests. We're talking about people that said something is not right here. Something is not in proper alignment. And we look around the room and people say, oh, my God, I thought I was the only one that saw it that way. Like literally Me Too I get it. I know how you feel. And that frustrates me too. And I refuse to believe that the way we're interacting with it now is the best way. So can we work together to find a better way forward? Um, so yeah, man, like, like share, share the crap because someone else is going to say, I get it. There's going to be far more people and far more compassionate and driven mm -hmm. people that say, I get it than those that laugh it off or walk away. Um, we'll welcome them back into the conversation when they're ready. Uh, but until then, man, there are so many people who are ready to have the conversation. They're just waiting on someone to say the first word. Yeah. And just be, yeah, be there and be present. When you're out meeting people and when you're talking to people, 
I'm sure you get kind of a lot of different information coming at, back at you, right? Feeding back to you. How have you dealt with that and making sure that you still feel like Chad at the end of that mm. and you're not taking in everyone else's? Yeah, it's, um, it's, that can be a hard line to draw. And, and I don't think I have any, um, overarching theme or, or any hard and fast rule on, on how to do it. Uh, but I think a piece of it comes from knowing my role in the conversation, uh, that my job as someone that works at events is to be present for the event. Uh, so if someone shares uh, a bit of their heart with me, like I take that with, with spoonfuls of gratitude, you know, like heaps and heaps of, of gratitude that this person didn't have to keep this in any longer. And Mm -hmm. what a blessing to, to be a safe place perceived as a safe place to receive that story that keeps you humble. Um, beyond that is just being honest, like, look, I'm not a counselor. Um, Mm -hmm. but if you can share what you just shared with a complete stranger, then perhaps you can share that with a counselor who may be a stranger at the moment, but they are far more equipped to, to help uh, to help on the road ahead. Uh, here are some great places that you can continue to share that story. And if it takes a long time to find a safe place to tell that story, then send us an email. We read and respond to every single email that comes in. Like we're to write love exists, not as a destination for anyone's treatment and recovery, but we are there to be uh, a highlighted pathway to those places that, that you can continue your journey. We're, we're a pit stop more or less. Right. Um, and feel free to, you know, come into that pit stop, get more gas, get a change on those tires whenever you need it. Uh, but, but know that there are, um, better places for you to keep driving towards. Um, so for me, it's, it's being honest with what I can provide and what I, I cannot provide. Um, but again, like you don't need a degree to be a friend, um, and you don't need decades of shared history to be a friend either. Uh, you can have legitimate, um, proper boundaried friendships that emerge over the course of a cup of coffee or, or a conversation. I get also a, a lot of solace from the rhythm of my job. Uh, there are some events that I go to each and every year that I've been going to for six, eight, 10, 12 years in a row. And there's people there that I get to see their stories unfold in these kind of snapshot moments. Uh, It's almost like a strobe light that you, Mm -hmm. you, you know, that that time is passing, but it's really hard to tell uh, how much, but meeting someone on the first week of their sobriety. And then the next year they run up to you and give you a hug and say, it's been a year and, and I'm feeling great. And they come up to you the next year and said, it's been a tough year and, and I messed up a bit, but you know what? Uh, the wheels are back on the wagon and, and we're still moving. And then the next year they say, look, I'm getting married next week and uh, I can't wait to send you pictures. And then you're talking to people that you knew had a suicide attempt eight years ago and now they're welcoming a, a new child into the world. Like that's, that's where it kind of comes in is these stories are, are sacred and unique and I've been invited into hundreds of thousands of them. And I can't give my full attention to everyone for every second of the year, but it's about, like you said, Robbie, being present in the moment. Um, and I think that sense of perspective and presence is what keeps me from burnout and also keeps me hungry. Uh, I have to act with a ton of imagination in my job. Mm-hmm. I have to fill in a lot of gaps with, uh, with, with hopeful hypotheticals. But the moments that those hypotheticals pay out, like, man, like that, that's really the, the reason I've, I've been around it for these past 12 years. Yeah. And it's great that just your path is different than a lot of people I talk to where you went into the organization that you're still with and still fulfilled by, but is it a lot of it too, just knowing that it's a mission you believe in? That's kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I could, um, well, no, I'll, I'll start again. I know that I could not work retail for, for 12 (laughs) years. Um, you know, and, and it's ironic because a lot of people look at my job and they see me selling shirts at 
a music festival and they're like, yeah, but you do kind of, no, I, I, I could give a damn if I sell anything. Like I'm, I'm here for, for people. Um, so yeah, I mean, having, having a clear focus on the mission, having a belief in, uh, uh, our past as an organization and having radical anticipation for, for what lies ahead. Like I said, that, that sense of imagination, I'm, I'm probably not living anyone's financial dream you know like i i don't know if retirement will ever happen in my life but uh i don't i've never been someone with a five-year 10-year 15-year plan uh Mm -hmm. i've been someone that says like look am am i fulfilled in this moment am i fulfilled in in these relationships um and yeah if if i wasn't I'd be gone um, because the organization needs people that, that are passionate. Uh, they don't need just a warm body to, to take up space. Um, so it comes down to certainly a, a, a pride of service. Um, I'm, I'm working a job that many people uh, are, are envious of. And I want to honor, um, I want to honor the, the hopes of other people. That's, that's great. And I think it's just a testament to, this kind of work in the nonprofit area, but also the kind of work you're doing with other people. And I probably just add that I'm not alone in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I hope I'm not alone in the nonprofit sector that, you know, that really desires to, to be a person that works myself out of a job. I, Mm -hmm. I would love it if to write love on our arms was no longer needed. I would love it if stigma no longer was prevailing voice in mental health conversations. I would love it if suicide has finally been removed from, uh, from like global um, as, as a global problem. Uh, so until that day, like I know that there's going to be more work to be done, but going back to our original story that was focused on one person, that is what has fueled my, my tenure, um, that it is, it would, it's way too daunting to try to say, I'm going to erase depression from, from the face of Mm -hmm. the the world. It's way easier to say, I'm going to make sure that Rabia feels seen and heard and better known by the end of this conversation. I'm going to make sure that, that Jack knows that someone is on his team. I'm going to make sure that Nora knows that she does not have to go through the rest of this event um, anonymously or, or by, by herself. So the only way we're going to affect change on a global level is by being responsible with the relationships that we're, we're given access to this day, this minute, this hour. Mm -hmm. So that actually brings me to something, I mean, that I'm sure you've had to talk about quite a bit, but we're in a time right now where isolation is abundant. It just is. And there's no, sometimes, I mean, you're not even allowed to leave your home, much less like having an option of somewhere to go. Have you seen a change in contacts you guys are receiving? And for you, I mean, it's different because you're not even in person, but Just how has the whole COVID situation impacted? Because I'm really shocked at how little we're hearing about the mental impact on people. Yeah, it's, I mean, I I think that definitely falls in line with how most of um, Americanized culture treats just general health, that for whatever reason, like mental health care is is not on par with Mm -hmm. physical health care. But we have seen numbers in the States from the CDC uh, that said um, this was released in uh, late August or early September. They said that one out of every four young people in the United States, uh, since COVID became you know part of our national consciousness, has thought about suicide seriously uh, since the pandemic began. And that's one in four people age eighteen to twenty four. These are people who. Uh, our college age or just starting their career that have already thought that maybe this is, I hate the term new normal, um, Mm -hmm. but maybe this is what's to be expected moving forward. Maybe hope is, is gone. One out of four is a shocking, shocking statistic, but look on the flip side of it. That means one out of four people, if you felt that way, 
one out of every four people you meet knows how you feel. So we have seen some numbers come out that draw direct lines between what this pandemic and what stay-at-home orders have created. Um, at the same time, thank God for, for technology that we have mm-hmm. in order to combat that sense of isolation. So the language that I've been using and, and been trying to preach everywhere is I'm not in the mood for, for social distancing, but we should and can and must physically distance. Uh, mm. But let's do all we can to not upset the social uh, connections that that we need. Like people are are pack animals, you know. Um, yeah. We need human interaction. I'm saying this as an introvert. Like I still need people speaking into my life. Um, I I don't need you know seas of humanity <laughs> coming <laughs> coming to my aid. But uh, but I do need my, my partner and I to have real talk. And I do need my best friends to chime in on group chat from time to time. I do need, uh, uh, cooking lessons with friends across the globe over zoom from time to time. Um, so, so yeah, like this, this is a hard time to navigate. Uh, but we have seen people that have leaned into the tools available uh, to to combat some of that isolation, whether that's with group hangouts over over Google or Zoom or, or whatever platform you use, uh, or if that's seeking mental health care options through telehealth, uh, mm-hmm. if that's um, going to a 12-step group virtually. Like, options exist and people are creative. Um, but yeah, like this is time that I'm not going to get back. Like, yeah, I, I, I can't on like rewind the clock and, and go to a festival that doesn't exist. I can't magically get my friends, their jobs back. I like, and that's heartbreaking to, to think about. Like there, there are going to be some fingerprints of trauma from this year that, that linger for quite some time. But I also trust in in the importance of the message and the importance of of your life that you still need and you still deserve an audience to your story. We're gonna have to find other options to share that. Um, mm-hmm. But I do believe together we can find options to to make that real. I think so too. I mean, and I found a cool site. It's Squad App which is a squad cast. So I guess I'm into the squad thing now, but it's okay. squadapp.io <laughs> and there's no login required. So the other night and I'm wearing Ezra Foreman t-shirt, but the other night, well, it was like 5 a.m. here in London and my friend in Portland, we watched the concert together. Yeah. It was a live stream concert. We watched it together and it was so awesome. And then for election night, I pulled an all nighter again because I'm just really all about healthy sleeping <laughs> habits lately. But I ended up on a call with, friends from all over. They invited friends. I invited some colleagues, my family joined for a while and we were just all watching results come in and talking. And we would have never done that outside of this kind of situation. Cause we would have just been all going about our things. And so I do think there has been a really great opportunity to connect with people in a different way, but it's just kind of almost accepting, okay, the present reality is such that, we need to connect in other ways and kind of not be technology averse and just do it and make sure we reach out, which is the hard, the hard thing is reaching out still. Yeah. And, and again, like you can never control who's going to pick up the phone or or respond Mm -mm. to the text, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth still going to voicemail or, or leaving uh, a string of texts, you know, um, to come through. Like, we we are super um, gifted and and blessed with technology. Um, however, you can never make someone respond. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to stop like casting that that lure out there, though. Um, yeah. You know, then that that's been that's been a case of humanity from day one. Is that looking back at my life, it's very clear that um, that we get to choose who we love we don't get to choose who loves us back. And that can be a source of, of immense frustration or that can be a source of immense grace. Um, the fact that I could not uh, convince someone, um, my, my friend, to, to stop caring about me, despite all the reasons I was giving her not 
to, to love me, uh, that was never my choice whether she was going to love me or not. So all that to say for, for you listening, uh, that person that you're thinking of that you haven't talked to in forever, send them a line, write them some snail mail, send them a text, you know, pop up on FaceTime um, and like do, do whatever you have to do and whether they respond or not, that's, that's on them. But we have, an amazing opportunity to reach out to people in unpredictable ways right now. Um, and who knows when that opportunity is going to be the opportunity that the other person needed. Yeah. And I think what that reminds me of too, is something I've struggled with and thought through more and talked to people about is like, don't keep score mm. as to whether last time you wrote, did they write back or whatever? Cause there's a, there's some people I've met here in London who um, are pretty open about just sort of neurodiversity as it's been explained to me. Right. And some people, they need a minute before they write back or they might never write back and that's it. And it doesn't mean that if you're thinking of them or you want to tell them something, you shouldn't, you know, just like you're saying, just do it. And if they respond great, but if not, maybe they just needed to hear from you. And, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's a good way of, of looking at it. Yeah. It, and, you know, share, share your heartaches and, and share your joys too. Like it's, it's all, it's all worth sharing. And uh, God, I, I love, I love what you said. I'm going to repeat it. Um, just to make sure it doesn't get swept under too many other words, but don't, don't keep score. Um, for one, if you still have the ability to keep score over these eight months, like your brain is already on a galactic level. Like I, <laughs> Time is a myth now. Um, so I don't yeah. know how you can keep score over who knows how long it's, it's been. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, like, you know, uh, we, we, have a, we have a dear friend. She was an intern uh, for us. And she's actually in your neck of the woods right now over in the UK. Um, but she, she recently said in conversation that empathy holds no space for shame. Uh, I, I think mm-hmm. that's another way of saying like, look, man, like th- this isn't about keeping score. Like this isn't about who's doing better, who's handling it better. This is about finding ways that, well, if you're keeping score, that means you're on different teams, right? This is about making sure we're communicating that we are on the same team. Yeah, no, that's true. And how has To Write Love on Our Arms dealt with this this kind of changing thing? I mean, I guess having an online presence already helps, but have you guys done any programs during COVID that people yeah, know about? Totally. So uh, right before uh, stay at home orders hit in the United States, uh, literally the day that, um, that our admin team told us don't come to the office tomorrow. Uh, we launched a page on our website that we call the self care page. So if you go to our website, which is TW L O H A.com in the upper right hand corner, uh, you'll see um, two colored buttons. One is blue that says find help. And the one right next to it is yellow and it says self care. This page was launched for COVID uh, for this era. Right. Uh, so there we have uh, a number of resources, whether they are apps um, or other websites to help you find um, uh, coping mechanisms, healthy coping mechanisms to deal with the anxiety and, and the isolation. Uh, we have links to resources such as those recovery meetings that happen virtually. Um, we have distractionary techniques, whether that's looking at some of our favorite shows or listening to a curated playlist that, that we put together or uh, taking some of our favorite designs from our T-shirts and turning them into coloring pages, you know. So, nice. And we're constantly looking for, for more ways to uh, kind of bridge that gap um, between, you know, what feels normal and, and what we're allowed to do in this moment. Um, beyond that, we've gotten, even though we have had a robust presence online, uh, we're learning about how to be more intentional with, with that digital space. Um, Mm -hmm. we radically moved up our podcast, uh, season this year. Um, that took us from March all the way up until like two weeks ago, (laughs) you know, so (laughs) long season, but, um, but it was, it was, it was good to feel active. Uh, we've done Facebook lives. We've done round table conversations. Uh, our, our campaigns that we normally have physical events for, uh, we turn those into all digital for both our annual 5k, uh, events and our world suicide prevention day campaign. 
And it, it's, it's been amazing. Like goals that we've had have been shattered uh, because people are, are still looking for ways to give back. Like generosity has not suffered through, through this time. Like the human spirit is still undefeated. Um, so we're still looking for, for new ways. We know that, that th- this is uh, going to linger for a while. Um, mm-hmm. So even though we're not traveling to your neck of the woods, um, we still want to find ways and creative ways to uh, meet you through roundtable discussions and through Instagram lives and, and, and you name it. Um, but it's, uh, it's tough. Like in the Northern hemisphere, um, we're getting less and less daylight, which means conversations yes. that are, are able to push back on some of that darkness are going to be more important than ever. We haven't had to do the pandemic when it's not daylight savings time yet. You know, <laughs> That's like true. we're, we're, we're like, there was no pandemic for dummies book that existed. <laughs> so we are all figuring this out and, and we're going to get a little bit better, um, day by day. Um, but again, the hope is to consistently meet people in ways that, that they want to be met. Uh, so dear listeners, you got cool ideas, send us an email. We, we want to, we want to see you, uh, let us know some, some new and creative and cool ways to see you. Yeah, and it's it's good, and I like the aspect of this particular part of our chat that I like is how it it is something that we haven't done before, and so we are going to keep evolving on how we handle it. Yeah, whether that's us as individuals or as organizations, because I was having a conversation the other day, and the person you know I did quite a bit during this time. I mean, started my podcasts, whatever, built a website, all that. But it was just stuff I needed to do. Like I had things I needed to get in the world, so I did them. And they were saying, you know, I didn't do anything. And now we're going to go into a second lockdown. And I don't have a plan. And I just kind of said, all right, then just what do you want to do? And make a plan and start working towards it. And if all you could do in the first part of this thing was just make it to where we are now, I think that was enough. And I don't think people are understanding that that you did what you could do during that time. And we're all doing that. And so I like the fact that maybe they can even just go to your website, people, if they are kind of lost one day and go, yeah. go to the self-help thing, but also recognizing, and I think what's good that you guys recognize this is really long <laughs> is that self-help and self or self-care, not self-help, but self-care, which could partly be related to self-help is something you can do. Yeah. That's, action and that's activity and that's taking action, right? It's maybe not putting up a website or getting a degree or whatever people think they should have done in eight months. I didn't, didn't expect to happen anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's so important. And not only is it actionable, but it's also not selfish. Self-care is, is a, an excellent way to model kind of your most hopeful politics. Like, mm-hmm. look, if someone, if someone on my team emailed me and said, Chad, I can't make this meeting. I, I have just been burning the candle at both ends. I just need time off. My knee jerk reaction is good. Take that time. I need you to, to be available down the road. We have a long fight ahead. So if, if that means taking a breather now, that's great. But if I were to wake up and look myself in the mirror and say, man, I am so burnt out. I've been burning the candle at both ends for too long, but I got to keep muscling through. Like I'm being a dick to myself. Like, <laughs> like how, how dare I give someone else I care about the benefit of the doubt and not extend it to myself. Like how it's good to be compassionate to others. It is also good to be compassionate to yourself. And that does yeah. Like if you find a new hobby or you have a new goal and you haven't had a ton of instruction on how to achieve um, any of these these goals. Like, cool. Like, keep failing forward. Keep mm-hmm. keep. I, I heard this the other the other day. Um, I think it was on an audio book. Neither here nor there. But uh, a character was reflecting on the fact that bad art is so much more valuable than good art. Think about it. Like, the best artists of our time, Pablo Picasso, or 
or Rembrandt or you, you name your favorite, they have so many failed pieces of art that never made their way to museums. Masterpieces are rare for a reason, but what all did we learn through the pieces that no one will ever see? What did we all learn through the sketchbooks or through Mm -hmm. the drafts uh, of, of that piece of writing that you've been working on? Like these are still teachable moments. So it doesn't have to be perfect to give it a go. Give it a try and see yeah. what you learn and see what skills you hone through that. Uh, because I tell you what, this world needs your creativity now more than ever. There's never been a better time to to take a risk and, and bet on yourself and try something. Um, because at the end of the day, like it exists for other people to say, yeah, me too. Yeah, I get that feeling. Yeah, I see the world the same way. Um, these are ways to to close the gap, uh, and and they're worth sharing to to build that better bridge. Yeah, no, that's really it's cool, and I I agree about the self being compassionate to oneself or showing grace to oneself. I was listening to Brene Brown, who is right. She's just one of the best. <laughs> Yes. genius of self-care <laughs> yes and she was saying you know if you're if you're not giving yourself time then it's you're not going to be able to give everything to everyone else mm-hmm. or anything to anyone else because you're not you don't have it yourself and so and it's a hard thing to remember to do but it's important i have really loved talking to you chad i mean this has been just one of the i don't know just one of the best things because you're you really are making a difference in your work and the organization you work for. And especially right now, it's just such a hard time for people. Um, For you during this time and just your role changing, has there been an impact to you that you've had to kind of reset how you're thinking of things? Yeah. And it's, man, it, it's changed so, so much. Um, and I think early on, I, I had um, someone kind of speak some wisdom into my life that it's like, look, like grieve, grieve what you've lost. Take time to grieve that. Um, there are, you know, if you take a second to to just imagine the people that, like in my life, uh, I work a lot in the the entertainment industry. I have friends that have lost a job and they don't know if that job will exist six, eight. 12 months from now. Um, We've had interns that gave four years of their life to, to learning uh, in order Mm -hmm. to graduate and they weren't able to walk in their own graduation. Uh, I've, I've seen friends that have had to delay weddings. I don't know when I'm going to be able to, to welcome my friend's baby into Mm -hmm. the world. I don't know. um, You know, there were people I didn't have a chance to say goodbye to. Uh, people, you know, with, with diseases, uh, or, or through accidental deaths, like these are moments that have been stolen from us. That is an injustice. Um, and my job, while it's changed a lot, like, like I mentioned earlier, I have to embody the hope that I believe still exists for other people. Um, and, and that's been hard. Like, Man, that first month of quarantine, when every day I would get an email from a festival saying we weren't, we're not happening anymore. Like that was just gut shot after gut shot. Um, but I was able to be really honest with, with how bad that hurt. And, and my team and my family really, uh, did an incredible job of communicating care to me because they were communicating that care. I'm now able to, to be a better communicator of that care to others. Like it's okay to be, to feel empty. Um, But I did have people pouring into me and now that they were pouring into me, I can pour into others. And that means Mm -hmm. I'm going to need more people pouring into me because you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, So, so yeah, like, again, I, maybe it's just the rebel in me. I refuse to accept this as a new normal. Um, So I'm going to be hopeful that, that a return to, uh, to more familiar times is on the horizon. But until then, um, I got to keep being humble and I got to keep being hungry. I need to, to examine um, the, the spots in my life that there's still way more to learn and then find ways to communicate what I'm learning to other people. 
over the years, I've tried to do my job alone and it was just so unnecessary and so lonely. Mm -hmm. And not only was I, I felt like I was shielding people from my stress, but what I was really doing was robbing them of an opportunity to celebrate with me when something awesome happened. Cause they don't know how, how much work went into that awesome thing. Um, this is the same way that keep sharing, keep, even if it's the worst thing that's happening in your life currently, keep sharing because I want to celebrate with you a week from now when, Mm -hmm. when we are a week removed from that shitty situation and a month from now, and then a year from now when you are dancing, because it's been a full year since that painful moment, like if you don't invite me into that now, I won't know that I can celebrate with you a year from now, you know? Yeah. So, so it, it, this is not toxic positivity. It's not manifesting joy. It's let's be real with this moment so that we can uh, treat the moment with its due honor as more time passes between now and, and where we'll be. Yeah, I agree. I think, and that's a, that's one of the, best ways I've heard it put. So I hope anyone listening is getting that, getting all these messages that you're sharing. Do you have any advice or mantra other than everything <laughs> so far that you, <laughs> that, you <laughs> that you, it's such an awkward question to ask when it, the whole, the whole um, conversation is really just this rich with all that, but any advice or mantra that maybe you like to just share with people in general, or have we hit one of them already? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, One thing I keep coming back to is, um, and this goes back to our original story. Um, whenever, whenever we get into conversations like this, my mind goes to, to what's cosmic. Uh, my, my mind goes to the universe and and outer space and all that. And, and I learned a couple years ago that for every year you exist on this planet, that three solar masses appear within the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so three things, roughly the size and power of our sun, are born every year. Hmm. That means, Rabia, that, that you have outlived some stars. That means that we're going to have some new constellations to name. And I need you to be around to help me come up with better names for them. That, that we are we are outliving something that is eternal in this moment. And these are stories that are going to continue to be passed down through generations and generations and generations when Chad and Rabia are long forgotten. The mm-hmm. lessons that we are living through right now, that's, that's a legacy worth sharing. And it's my hope that in this time, we can embody something that is bigger than this disease that we can embody something that is more powerful than, than isolation and that, that we can draw lines. If we can draw lines between stars and we can certainly draw lines between you and I, yeah. uh, whether that's through Wi-Fi from London to, uh, to Melbourne, Florida, <laughs> or anywhere in between, uh, there are connections worth discovering. Um, yeah. And we're going to need your perspective to help identify what those are. Great. Well, cool. So I just have a fun five and they're like supposed to be fun. Some people get a little stressed out about them, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it on. This came because of my wardrobe, I guess, but what's the oldest t-shirt you have and still wear? Mm, Oldest. Ooh. And still wear. I have a lot that I've just retired to my wife's ire. Um, on (laughs) on top of like a shelf, it's just like a collection of shirts. Uh, the oldest one that I still wear is, I have a I have a shirt from uh, from a tour that I went on with my buddies. Uh, they're in a metal band called O Sleeper, uh, and I have an old tour shirt of theirs that that still comes up in rotation every so often. Great, yeah, and I know I've heard a few people talk about their spouse or partner definitely making sure they did not have a lot of their teachers <laughs> anymore. Um, I think the fact that I don't have one is why I have, you know, some of the t-shirts I do. Ooh, actually I have a, I have another answer. Um, so oh, my, good. my favorite American football team, uh, we were really, really good back in the eighties and have been really, really bad ever since. And I have a, uh, a championship shirt from 1988 of theirs 
I, I didn't own it back in 1988 because I was just a, a little toddler, but I found it on eBay and, uh, and every so often, um, it, I, I wear it to remember good days that I couldn't even remember <laughs> because I was what too team? young. What um, team is that? They're, they're now the Washington football team. Um, oh, okay. Oh, gotcha. Okay. But, yeah. That's, that's my, well, I just went through, I, I grew up in LA, so I'm a Dodgers fan. So I just went through this whole 32 oh, congratulations. year. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, not, not the worst 2020, but still bad, <laughs> but yeah, so I get it. Um, all right. And a lot of people are referring to this year as like just groundhogs day, right? Like every day is the same. You're waking up in your home doing the same thing, whatever. What song would you have on your alarm clock? If it really was groundhogs day. Hmm. Song on my alarm clock. If it was legitimately groundhogs day, uh, it would be, uh, it'd be a Hall and Oates song. You make my dreams come true by Hall and Oates. Great. Yeah. So you'd get up at least bopping a little bit go. every morning. Bum, yeah. Bum, good. Bum, 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. This is a very important one. Coffee or tea or neither. Coffee. Black as my heart. <laughs> I know. I've, I said the other day, yeah, oh, this is bitter. And so it's just a good match for me, <laughs> this coffee. <laughs> but yeah. Um, do you remember like the last time you laughed so hard you cried or just couldn't stop like your last like really big um, laugh so hard. I cried. I, I can't remember that, but the loudest I laughed that kind of shocked me with how loud, uh, was my wife and I have been working through Brooklyn nine, nine. Oh, okay. And, and there are just moments that like just such a great show for character development. And then these pithy zippy one liners that just like creativity world collides to make this mm-hmm infinitely humorous thing happened so i can't remember the exact punchline of the joke and even if i were to to butcher it here like the show deserves more than than a, a retelling go watch okay. brooklyn 99 it's brooklyn 99. very funny some good laughs all right and the last one is who inspires you right now man um my wife like she's kicking all sorts of butt in grad school right now even remotely Great. Um, she's, she's my hero. She's been my hero ever since I met her. And yeah. Um, like, yeah, she's, she's just totally killing it. Um, really inspired by, uh, my friend Ebony Janice Moore. Uh, we've had her on our podcast a mm-hmm. couple times, really, uh, inspired by my friend Yana Kalu. Uh, they, uh, work for Trans Lifeline and just such a big fan of their work. Really inspired by my friend uh, Levi, who is uh, who is a poet. He he helped speak into uh, our our World Suicide Prevention Day campaign, and love him to death. Yeah, and these like some of these relationships, like uh, for example, Ebony Janice and Yana. These are two people that I would not have met if not for COVID. Um, Mm -hmm. those were conversations and perspectives that we were trying to draw out intersections with. I I know you said, keep this light. I'm sorry. No, no, you, Uh, (laughs) no, this is who inspires you. That's great. Yeah. So, so Ebony Janice was, uh, really speaking to, um, BIPOC, uh, mental health matters. Uh, Mm Um, so getting to, uh, to poke around her brain for, for perspectives, especially during, um, like. Uh, that season of protests in the wake of mm-hmm. uh, Ahmaud Arbery and, and George Floyd um, and so many others, she gave such gifted perspectives. And uh, and Yana is one of the smartest people I, I've interacted with. Uh, just brilliant, brilliant thinker and such a a, a great doer. Just gets stuff mm-hmm. done. So yeah, okay. cool. And I'll I'll make sure I drop links to those as well those episodes of your podcast and cool, yeah. show notes so people can look them up i'm sure people will be interested i'm interested um all right anything else that you'd want to promote at all we'll have the show notes but anything you want people to like yeah yeah so we um you, you mentioned earlier that you went uh skydiving in, in one of our t-shirts once upon i did a time uh if this if 
conversations about mental health are important to you, definitely check us out. Again, that website is TWLOHA.com. Uh, we still have a number of, of shirts available. In fact, we just dropped a, a bunch of new designs. And, and while those are really effective in helping us fundraise to, to fund our programs, um, they're also great just to start conversations. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, mental health is not something that we as a culture have prioritized in conversation. But we talk about shirts all the time. Where'd you get that? Yeah. What's that mean? You know, so this is a great way to, uh, to, to show um, that you're on a team that cares about mental health, but also hopefully to uh, welcome people into pieces of conversation. So you can check that out uh, through our website or just go to store.twiloha.com. Cool. Well, thanks, Chad. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. No worries, Rabia. You. You're you're amazing. You're a super gifted host, and and uh, yeah, I'll be cheering on the podcast. Cool. Well, thanks. So that was a really special chat for me, for those of you who listened all the way to the end. And I just want to make sure one thing we did discuss quite a bit, and I want to make sure people know that if you're struggling right now, get help. Talk to a friend. Call a friend. If I'm your friend, call me or reach out to me. But there's no reason that you have to just be alone in it. I've had to tell friends lately especially, hey, I'm just having a rough time. I couldn't watch the news a couple weeks ago for a couple days. It was just giving me almost panic attacks. And I just hate the idea that anyone's struggling and just has some pain that they feel like they can't offload, that they have to hold on to. Holding on to the pain won't make it go away. It'll just kind of make it build up over time. So I just want to stress that. I really appreciate you listening. For me, this was a bucket list interview. This was so important to me to be able to introduce this organization to people who hadn't heard of it yet. And Chad was so generous with his time. I actually had to get my power cord in the middle of the interview. And I also had another one run over. I mean, it was a tough, tough day that day, but he was really kind and really generous with his time. So thanks for listening. You're going to hear the end credits right now. But I just want to say I hope that this helped someone. And if it did help you and you want to let me know, please do. But just please make sure you reach out to someone if you need help. Thanks for joining me this week. You can find out more about our guest in the show notes. The music you're probably moving to by now is by Joe Mafia. Find him on Spotify. That's Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. And Rob Medke is responsible for our visual design. You can find him online by searching for Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Thanks, Rob. Let us know who you'd like to hear from or about your own experiences defining yourself outside of work at More Than Work Pod on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Give us a follow. Or visit our website at RobbiaSaid.com. Subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening to More Than Work. We'll be back next week with another guest. In the meantime, while being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.